They tried to stop my show, uh, but I said, hold up. Y'all know how many hoes done tried to hold this hoe up. Tokyo Talk boy. to music. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Craig's Pop Life Podcast, a black gay excursion into pop culture with your host, me, <laughs> Craig Seymour. What's up, everybody? So glad to be back with you. So glad to just be hanging. Um, So if you're new to the revamped podcast, basically what I'm doing now is revisiting some of my older writing, starting with the very beginning of my career, and just kind of feeling, you know, just in that reflective sort of space, just kind of feeling how far I've come and just also just... um, sort of using it as a sort of backwards goal, I guess, you know what I mean? Sometimes we accomplish things in life and later in life we almost wonder how we ever accomplish those things because they seem so out of reach and they seem so out of reach with what our current circumstances are. But, you know, that's why I think it's important to revisit what we've done in the past and just kind of use that as a way to see how we're going forward ahead in the future. Right. Am I right? Am I right? Are we trying to forge ahead in the future in 2024? I know that's right. So anyway, this, I'm reading two pieces today. Um, The first piece, well, they're both from 1998. So if you were following one of the earlier podcasts, you know that my math was not always mathing. So basically, in 1998, that was 26 years ago. And I was 27 years old, and I think that that was the most important age in my entire life. I mean, that's really when I sort of drew drew a line in the sand. Not that I lived near anybody's beach. I was in D.C. But I drew a line in the concrete, drew a a chalk line on concrete, okay? And um, really wanted to change the complete direction of my life and really just was trying to figure that out and didn't really know how to do that or really have a lot of people that could help me do that. So it was a really, um, it was a really provocative time in my life. And in fact, if you read my memoir or listen to it, if you're not sick of my voice after this, but you can listen to my memoir, All I Could Bear, My Life in the Strip Clubs of Gay Washington, D.C. It's available on Audible. All you got to do is get you a, a trial. You don't even need to pay up front. Um, and you listen to it in a few hours so you can then just cancel the trial if that's how, you know, what you need to do, if that's how your finances is looking or you really don't mess with the audiobooks like that. But anyway, so um, just a very, very special part of my life and it's really, really cool to have it so documented through the memoir and through these early music writings to really get a sense of where my head was. So the first review I'm going to read is about a compilation for this great party that used to take place in New York called Body and Soul. So here we go. Musical Notations with Craig Seymour. Take a close look at the dance music section of your favorite CD store, and you'll notice that while the space for individual artists is getting smaller, the various artists compilation is compilation section is expanding like an unstoppable B-movie ooze. Now, while it's admittedly fun to see compilations like Ultimate Dance Party and The Greatest Dance Album in the World compete in a battle of superlatives, most of these compilations have more to do with with a shrewd marketing plan than a hot night in the club. And I was having hot nights in the club, so I did not. Body and Soul Volume 1 bucks these conventions on more than one account. For one, it's not called Utmost Body and Penultimate Soul, the last volume you will ever need. Secondly, it evokes neither a clever marketing scheme nor a fierce night out. Body and Soul Volume 2 compiles the deep house music played at a weekly Check Your Negative Vibes at the Door Sunday afternoon dance party in New York City. As suggested by the title, the music combined, compiled speaks. Rewind. As suggested by the title, the music compiled speaks to. Cha. Now this is a good thing, a good editing tip. 
read your stuff out loud. If you keep stumbling over something, something is wrong with it. You don't even need to know what exactly it is wrong, but you just need to rewrite it until you can read it without stumbling on it. So I don't know what's wrong with this sentence, but something's wrong with this sentence because I've done, um, done tripped up on it two times now. It's not going to be a third. Let me get this right, okay? As suggested by the title, the music compiled seeks to speak to the body and the soul. I figured out what's wrong with this. This, this is a really good um, writing lesson for people who are trying to um, really improve their writing to that extra next level. It's not about just being, being able to be comprehended or even for people to enjoy it, but you really want to take it to that next level to just refine your craft to this degree. The problem with this sentence is I said, seeks to speak. Nobody in life would say seeks to speak. That's like a tongue twister. That's like saying unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York. Uh-uh. Seeks to speak, seeks to speak, seeks to speak. No. Do not put tw tongue twisters in your writing. So I'm going to read this again. As suggested by the title, the music compiled seeks to speak to the body and the soul. Thus, the collection is heavy on spiritual themes, including Kenny Bobian's Sylvester-like take on the gospel song, Why We Sing. Of course, spirituality is just one of the things that some people use the dance floor to escape from. For these folks, the compilation offers Fonda Ray's Sultry Living in Ecstasy and Dangerous Vibes, Teaching legendary vibraphonist Roy Ayers. Is that how you pronounce vibraphonist? The gem of the collection is the previously unreleased club mix of Valerie George's Being Single Ain't Easy. On what is regrettably her one and only single, this down to earth diva crafts a bittersweet musing on single life. Ultimately, Body and Soul is much more than a collection of unreleased mixes and hot hits. It creates a mood that's both danceable and uplifting. It's even worth a try for people who think they hate Deep House. If you think about dance music less as an escape than as a journey, Body and Soul Volume 1 will take you there. Okay, great. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. But do you all see how, um, how like one little thing like that seeks to speak? Nobody, it, that's one of those things like editors would generally wouldn't notice that. Nobody would ask you to take it out. Nobody would think because there's nothing wrong with it. But when you read it, you see that there is something that the point is you don't want to draw attention to your words. The point is you want to draw attention to your meaning. You want to draw attention to what you have to say. So when you have a little unique New York, when you have a little tongue twister in here that seeks to speak, then that just adds, that that's just something that is unnecessary that's getting in the way of your point. So those are the type of things back when they let me still teach students and stuff and I was still in the game of teaching writing and all this kind of stuff. But that was the, that's the type of stuff that I focus on because it's those little things that make the difference between great writers and very, very good writers. But the thing is, most people don't know what that subtle distinction is. They'll just think, oh, this person is a better writer, and oh, this person, you know, is just not as good, when really all it comes down to is a simple accidental tongue twister that's in the piece that can easily be edited out. So, very simple, um, very simple advice that will really change your writing. There was something else in this that I wanted to bring up too, but, I can't think of what it is, so it will just have to wait. So the second piece that I'm going to read is really a special piece for me because it just, um, oh, it just, it, it's, it's about um, the music of Black Gay Pride. And if you don't know, in D.C. there's a separate Black Gay Pride, and it's just, it used to just be called Black Pride. I don't know what it's called now. But in the 90s, it used to just be called Black Pride. And um, it took place at Banneker Field. And it was just this wonderful, all-black, queer 
loving space. And I wanted to, because music is so important to me, I wanted to write about the music um, of the event. And this kind of goes back to the review that I did, I think, two weeks ago when I was talking about the super raw disco. So again, there's ever since the very beginning, and not by any sort of design, just by me following the things that I love, I've always been interested in the black gay roots of dance music, and that's kind of followed through to today. So this one is called Worthy of Pride, and this is from May 22nd, 1998. I'm not doing the math again. Y'all got it the first time. So here we go, Worthy of Pride. Next to Christmas, Black Pride Day is my favorite day of the year. Now see, I'm, I'm going to dismiss, I am going to get through these things and read it, but now that I'm in my writing critique, um, now that I'm in my, y'all, I have a new mic and I'm hearing all sorts of noise, stuff going on outside and stuff that I do not hear in life, but I hear on this mic, so I apologize if it's too um, noisy, but I don't want, personally, at this particular time, I don't have a soundproof chamber, so those little noises, but it sounded like all World War Three outside and it's just like a peaceful day and nothing's going on, but this mic is micing. A mic that was only $30 on Amazon, by the way, so can't get you a discount. Um, can't get you discount stuff these days. So anyway, but what I was going to say is don't put, the, don't have word repetition in your pieces in a short piece, but most definitely do not do it in your first sentence. So I did here, next to Christmas, Black Pride Day is my favorite day of the year. What I should have done is replace that second day with something. Is my favorite time of the year, is my favorite something of the year. But doing the day twice um, is not advisable. So let's just start again now. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit my stuff while I'm reading it. Next to Christmas, Black Pride, Ooh, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to keep it real. That's why I stumbled out. I'm sorry. Next to Christmas, Black Pride Day is my favorite day of the year. While I'm always as proud of my gayness as I am of my blackness, as the motto of the D.C. Coalition of Black, Lesbian, Gays, and Bisexual States, it's nice to have one day to celebrate both at the same time within the black community. As a teenager, I spent many weekends hanging out around back Banneker Field, acting wild with friends in the McDonald's across the street, and being called a punk whenever I accidentally dropped my guard and let myself have too much fun. Because of this, seeing Banneker Field packed each year with mostly wet, it's just a reference, it rained a lot, black gays and lesbians in cathartic, yeah. Because of this, seeing Banneker Field pack each year with mostly wet black gays and lesbians is cathartic in a way that other Pride Days could never be. It tells me not only that I've come home, but that someone's turned down the bed. As with each other celebration I partake in, each year I need a soundtrack for Black Pride Weekend, a selection of songs to provide context for the weekend's events. Usually I need a whole crate of songs, but this year my lone soundtrack is Jumpin' 2, classics from the disco underground. What sets this compilation apart from other classic disco compilations is that it contains several songs that specifically touch on feelings associated with gay pride, black or otherwise. For instance, the set opens with Teddy Pendergrass's you Can't Hide From Yourself, a hard lesson many of us have had to learn. A hard lesson many of us had to learn before we could even make it to our first Pride Day. I know that's right, you can't hide from yourself. Hmm. The collection also includes Black Pride party staples from Sylvester and Carl Bean. While most people know Sylvester from his hits like Do You Want a Funk and the criminally overplayed, ugh, you make me feel mighty real. Over and over, included in this collection, is his underground classic, notably because of its gospel-esque breakdown. Midway through the song, 
the music is stripped bare, leaving little more than syncopated hand claps, joyful tambourines, and Sylvester trading soulful melismas with his extraordinary cadre of background vocals. Unquestionably, this is disco at its revivalist best. Also suited for a revival is Carl Bean's I Was Born This Way, featuring the simple yet moving chorus, I'm happy, carefree, and gay. I was born this way. The very existence of this song challenges the notion that black culture is especially homophobic. After all, the record was released in 1979 by the preeminent black-owned record label of the time, Motown. Even with all these selections, the song getting the most repeats on my CD player is Inner Life's 1982 Last Days of Disco classic, Moment of My Life. Over a thumping piano riff, legendary vocalist Jocelyn Brown spins a funky self-empowerment tale, which over a thumping piano riff, legendary vocalist Jocelyn Brown spins a funky self-empowerment tale, which takes her from living a life that felt like pouring rain. Mm. A life that felt like pouring rain. Let that sink in for a second. A life that felt like pouring rain. Not, not drizzle. Not a life that felt like drizzle. Not a life that was, that was overcast a little bit. Not, you know, some sprinkles of, of sun shower. A life that felt like pouring rain. Mm. To making the resounding declaration, this is the end of tearing my life apart. On the surface, the song is about finding a romantic lover, but the lyrics can easily be interpreted as finding, embracing, and loving yourself, which after all, is the ultimate meaning of pride. So yeah, you know, I think just looking back, that was the first, this, the Pride review was the first review, oh, it was the first review that I read with Pride. <laughs> because it just, it was so special to me because it enabled me to articulate so many things that were important to me, things about black culture, about black gay culture, about stereotypes about black gay culture things about dance music being, needing to be more soulful and all those kind of things. So it was just really special to me. And so this was the review for years that was the one that I would be, um, you know, that I would show or when I would send out clips, this was one. And I don't know that anybody else ever said anything about it. I'm not sure that they, <laughs> it's not one, it's not a review that people come to me and say, Oh, I really love that. Oh, I mean, I don't think a lot of people have seen it, but in terms of my early reviews, it's definitely the one that um, is the most special for me because at the time it enabled me to express things that I wasn't able to say otherwise. But now it shows this great continuity throughout my career where you still have a situation where I'm writing about black gay club music and I'm... Um, writing about black gay issues just in general. So I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of um, writing tips. It's just I like can't help go back and edit my own stuff when I'm reading it through. And you know, that's the thing where I really, um, where I'm really sad that some of the younger generation doesn't have um, access to these really experienced editors who were just around for decades and decades the people that edited my work, because for even the, the, like even those small things that I found in the Metro Weekly um, piece, the editor of Metro Weekly, he found a gazillion other things. It wasn't like those are the things, it's like those are the things that I'm looking at now, ha having been in the business for almost 30 years and having worked with editors from um, all over the gamut, because there's just a difference. When, when I worked with the, um, Washington Post, news editors just edit things different than entertainment editors who edit things differently. So because I was able to bounce around a lot in my career at that particular time, um, I was able to get a lot of experience. So I hope you all enjoyed this. This was so much fun for me. 
and I will definitely be back next week with more vintage reviews and more random assigns and more, maybe more um, writing advice. So I love you guys for listening, and I will talk to you next week. Bye, y'all.